All right. What an incredible first day we've had. What do you think? It's been a great day? Thank you, thank you. It's been so amazing to be back here today with all of you, and it's hard to believe we're now at our last talk of the day already. Our next guest is one of the godfathers of blockchain and an undeniable authority on Web3. So whether you're a Web3 advocate, a DGEN, or want to learn more, this next talk is 100% wag me. Please welcome The Intercept's Murtaza Hussein and co-founder of Ethereum and Polkadot, entrepreneur and computer scientist, Gavin Wood. Gavin, pleasure to chat with you today. Nice. Uh, Thank you. Nice a very, very robust crowd showed up. Very curious and answered some questions today. So I wanted to start by asking you something, and it's my own curiosity in part, but I think it's shared by many people. Web3. I've heard this term a lot in the last year. I don't fully know what it means or how to characterize it. I think like a lot of people, I tend to associate with cryptocurrency markets and token markets and so forth, which I think may be a bit incorrect. I'd like to hear from you, from someone who's many years in the space, what does Web3 mean in the short term? If you can describe it in comparison to the internet people are familiar with. Uh, yeah, it's, um, I mean, I came up with the term back in 2014. Um, it's, I think, I think different people do use it to mean kind of different things. Um, but what I specifically meant by it when I, when I wrote this, like, um, almost manifesto, um, was something akin to um, an internet or a web, an application platform, uh, where there was no great need, or where there was, we, we fundamentally reduced the need to trust service providers. So, you know, if we think of Web1, this was like a, 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 an awesome data publication system. People could publish web pages, you could link them together, people could um, could read basically information, uh, whatever it was that people, other people had put on the internet. Great stuff. Web 2 took this and sort of introduced additional technologies in order to create what, what we currently know as like a, the application platform of the internet, right? If you, uh, the web is a great way of like introducing an application to, the, um, to you know, everybody else in the world. It can be massively multi-user. The application can allow many different people to interact with each other. Um, and uh, and it, it's fast. No one has to download extra software to use it. But the big issue is that it comes with this, this huge sort of almost invisible requirement that there's a service provider behind the service. And these service providers tend to be very centralized entities, usually like a, a, a specific uh, single company that is running the service and that's aggregating all of the various um, data of the users and is providing the single source of truth and the single source of trust, single source of authority for these users um, to, um, you know, interact with each other, whether it's sending messages or sending money, um, voting or whatever else that they're using the service for. Um, it's this service provider that is telling them if, they're, if what they're doing is okay. And Web3 was really meant to be the service without the service provider. It's very interesting. So I actually got into journalism uh, very early because of the Snowden documents and the Snowden revelations. For those who don't remember, it's been maybe 10 years now. Uh, there were revelations from a whistleblower from the National Security Agency in the U.S. about widespread surveillance taking place uh, by the U.S. government using, in some cases, uh, data from these centralized service providers. So what's interesting what you're saying is that there's not this intermediary in the middle when you're doing things on the Internet. Uh, there's somebody, it's more decentralized environment. On a technical side, how does that work? And for those who tend to connect it more with these financial markets we've seen for tokens and so forth, which at the moment people who may have noticed are down a little bit, uh, what is, is there a connection between the two? Are they necessary? Or should we think of them as two separate uh, phenomenon, uh, a technology, technology platform and a market, or do they need each other? Yeah, I think really uh, it is important to, to consider the technology and the platform and that, really, it's like a lot of different sort of, it's an aggregate platform. There are many different technologies 
that are utilized within the sort of uh, the platform itself. So like Web2 is an aggregate platform as well. There are many different technologies, JavaScript, CSS, um, HTML. We've got like backend uh, systems, you know, Apache and whatnot. Um, Python, like there, there are many different technologies that sort of come together that developers can pick and, pick and choose in order to deliver their application. Uh, it's the same with Web3. It's not like a single technology, but there are many different technologies. And the sort of technological um, mechanisms that we use are things like, well, there are two key things. The first is cryptography. We make substantial use of cryptography to give individual users, individual participants, hard guarantees about things like um, data accessibility. Who can access their data at any given time? Who can see their data at any given time? Who is able to aggregate and see the results of the aggregation of the data? Um, we also use um, economics, game theory, and sort of widely termed crypto economics in order to provide these like much, much larger aggregate services like a consensus, like smart contracts, like decentralized application platforms in order to provide guarantees without having to trust any individual service provider for those guarantees. So it's interesting. So there's not this uh, middleman in ensuring, doing surveillance or ensuring sometimes the, uh, the functioning systems. They function in a decentralized manner. So what are some of the functions? You Actually, I'd like to frame it a different way. If you look at people's internet experience today, what's going on on the front end and the back end, how would theoretically some years from now, if these Web3 applications come to fruition, how might it be different on the front end and how might it be different on the back end in terms of overseeing the surveillance, but also the day-to-day -day experience of using the internet? Yeah, I, I would hope that like a lot of the, the, the front end technologies probably are not going to change dramatically, or at least if they do, they'll change for both uh, Web 2 you know, presentation and Web 3 presentation. So in terms of like really user experience, we should be aiming for something that, it, you know, I, I don't see any obvious um, like key differences between Web 2 user experience and Web 3. They should both be seamless, they should both be beautiful, they should both be a joyous experience. But the key thing is what's going on in the back end and the guarantees that the users are getting when they use the service. Um, these guarantees under Web 2 are basically fine print lawyers. Um, uh, they are, uh, users generally click, you know, accept terms and conditions without really considering um, what, what they really mean. And that's really the guarantees that users are getting when they use a Web 2 service. It's like effectively none. And if they were to try to use them as guarantees, they'd probably have to hire a lawyer to understand exactly what guarantees it is. Whereas with Web3, it's a little different. With Web3, um, the guarantees are codified in terms of the underlying technology and any of the program code that, that you know, is sort of the, maybe the slightly higher level um, uh, 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 programmatic representation of the guarantees, smart contracts, in other words. It's interesting. So you know, if you think about the current tech landscape, there's a lot of hegemonic control of a few big players of people's internet experience, and people know who they all are and so forth. And that's suboptimal for many reasons. But a lot of critics of what you could call Web3 right now, their, ten, their contention is, OK, this technology is aiming at displacing those hegemons, but it'll create a new set of big players and hegemons. Is that the case? And how do you respond to that, that uh, criticism that's been leveled in some cases? But I think the, the, the core of the accusation is that, OK, we should use regulation to break up the big tech companies and then you know, distribute this way. But you're talking more of a technological solution to that problem. Tell me uh, how that works and how uh, you would respond to that sort of framing. I mean, it's hard to, um, you know, I, I, can't, I can't sit here in all uh, honesty and sort of claim that 100 years hence, the technology could never possibly be used for uh, you know, uh, some centralized power to assert control. But what I can say is that the technology is designed in order to give users the ability to understand at a, at a very fundamental level how their interests are being protected. We use like openness and transparency for this. The technology is fundamentally based on openness and transparency. Um, unlike Web 2 technologies, Web 2 social constructs, which are fundamentally based on trust and opaqueness. Mm. You don't have any right to go to Facebook and have your auditor audit their systems. That is not a right that you get by using Facebook services, mm. right? Maybe at a push, 
you could, your government might possibly be able to have some kind of right for that, but then you can't audit your government that they're actually acting in your interests behind the scenes either. So Web3 is designed with this level of openness and transparency fundamentally being a part of it, so you can audit it. Now, maybe you don't always want to audit it. Maybe you're lazy and you choose not to audit it, but the point is that you can. And this is a crucial difference, because when push comes to shove, you at least have the option. You know, that's very interesting, because I actually was very intimately familiar with this after working on the Snowden stories, because I saw how pervasive the surveillance apparatus can be. And I do think that surveillance is a very key prerequisite for power generally, and we don't underestimate how much power accrues from those who have the ability to do surveillance. And what you're describing is more a transparent system of gathering data and so forth. To so people who, like I've heard this rebuttal many times, like, well, I don't care. I don't care about someone surveilling me. I'm not doing anything wrong anyways. Or I don't need to see my data because my data is, you know, it's not really my concern and so forth. And I think that's a very short-sighted perspective, but I'm actually curious what you say to that in the sense of how may somebody who's very seemingly superficially satisfied with their Web 2 experience uh, maybe losing out or missing out on the big picture of what the implications are of the sacrifice of their data to these opaque entities? Yeah, I mean, uh, the usage of, of, of big data is probably a, um, uh, a potentially fairly substantial part of what makes you know, Web2 applications so nice, and certainly what makes Web2 application providers so rich. Um, I think there is an underlying economy here. I think, um, I think at this point, it's incredibly opaque. We don't know precisely the cost of, um, of, of the provision of Google services. Similarly, we don't know the value to Google of the, uh, the individual user using those services. Like, it's, it's simply a closed economy. And as long as it's a closed economy, it's likely to be in a single participant's favor, Google's. The point of Web3 is in part to open up economies, to reduce barriers and to make things more, um, more transparent and to make markets function um, more seamlessly, more efficiently. And this ultimately could mean uh, opening up the possibility of data provision, aggregation, and sale into a far wider market so users at least get the opportunity to decide which elements of their data are investigated, aggregated, under what conditions they're aggregated. Can we, can we guarantee users that it will definitely not be identifiable? We don't have that guarantee right now. Of course, Google could put it in their fine print, but at the end of the day, they only have to provide a best effort if anything goes wrong they're not going to be the ones suffering under a lawsuit. If it is, it's probably not going to be a lawsuit that's really going to kill them. So, you know, you were integral in the founding of Ethereum and also Polkadot. What, do you, what are you building right now, and what do you foresee for the future of this new internet, which is, you know, iteratively being developed at the moment under this banner of Web3? Um, you know, we're currently, I think, still in relatively early days of the development of this technology and of this like wider aggregate platform. Um, but we are making uh, substantial progress. And one of the key elements is to not lose sight of what it is that's actually different. Like, that we are actually giving users guarantees back, credible expectations that the technology works as they believe it does. Um, and as soon as we start losing sight of that, as soon as we start, like, as soon as um, Web3 becomes cluttered with these Web 2.5 platforms that kind of are Web3 in name, but Web2 in nature, um, then we start uh, risking that the world will not change, that we will be beholden to these trust-bound platforms and the trust-bound service providers, the princes, that, that, that this technology creates. So I think, for me at least, the, the, the coming like five, 10 years is really about staying on target, developing the technologies in their fullest, and ensuring that the technology that people use is actually the technology um, that they believe they're using, and that they're getting the guarantees that they expect. So it's very interesting because I see the technology as very decentralizing and disruptive to establish oligopolic uh, oligopolistic players in the tech space. And I'm curious, are they hostile to it or are they skeptical of it? I've seen maybe some attempts to co-opt it into maybe what you've called Web 2.5. Uh, you can say some major companies have tried to use some of these terminologies to brand 
uh, what they would like to build in the future. Is there a necessary tension between big tech companies that are centralized as they exist and this technology? Or do they, can they cohabit? Can it be used by them? What's the actual dynamic here? Uh, the yeah, I kind of see it as a bit similar to um, you know, the, the advent of the internet, the advent of the modern web. Um, and you know, I, I, I remember like back in the late 90s, early noughties, people were asking questions of like, well, okay, the internet's going to revolutionize commerce, right? Does this mean that like the big, the big high street brands are going to do most of their sales on the internet in the future? And it's like the big high street brands, by and large, few, a few exceptions, but by and large, didn't move over to the internet, right? It was Amazon. It was an internet native company um, with an internet native attitude that was able to capitalize on this new technology. And I think it's realistically going to be the same with Web3. Yeah, the Web2 guys will, will eventually kind of see that, oh, hold on, like um, zero transaction costs. Yeah, this is, this is probably like a useful thing. We kind of need to integrate this into our business model. But as, as individuals with a business model that is fundamentally based upon trust, upon um, a, a single centralized service to draw in the users and basically tell them, hey, don't worry about your interest, we've got it covered. This is not going to be a particularly um, a, a useful proposition in a world where trust is essentially commoditized. In the same way as those high street brands were not a useful proposition in a world that didn't need the high street anymore for commerce. And so this kind of brings me back to where I started was with recent developments in uh, you know, the markets and crypto and so forth. But not so much in the changes in them recently, in the volatility, but what, how does it connect then? In the sense of Ethereum, Polkadot, how do they underlay this new Web2 system? And what's the necessary connection between these assets? People have become familiar with you, the financialization, and the actual foreseen technological application of them in the next five to ten years. I mean, you know, technology is, is uh, usually quite iterative. Eventually, like, maybe a, a major sort of key piece of technology is, is innovated, but by and large, we learn from our, from our past, and, and we, you know, as, as builders, we strive to create new, better things in our future. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I think I, I kind of see a similar path. Um, I, I learned a bunch when I did Ethereum, um, and I, you know, kind of understood better what, what needed to be created to make Web3 a reality. Mm -hmm. And in many respects, the lessons uh, that I learned in those years are sort of made good um, with Polkadot. And I mean, the, the, the cru one of the crucial lessons that I, that I realized was smart contract platforms, the, the platforms that we sort of see a lot in, in the crypto um, market, um, these, these kind of programmable platforms, they don't really fulfill the needs in order to create a truly Web3 based um, uh, application, massively multi-user application platform that's capable of, of, um, of largely eclipsing Web2. And when I understood this, I kind of also understood that, you know, Polkadot um, has, to, has to integrate, has to free itself from this cryptocurrency-centric notion. It cannot pass the interests of the dot currency onto um, the, uh, the interests of the end user of applications on its platform in the same way that Bitcoin does and Ethereum does. And so one of the key innovations within Polkadot was to create a platform that application providers, these, these teams that use Polkadot, um, can utilize for their application without passing on knowledge of this like token, of the dot token, to their users. It would be a bit like Google passing on knowledge of Google's electricity provider mm -hmm. onto its search users. It right. wouldn't make any sense. Its search users don't care where uh, Google gets its electricity from. They care that Google, Google gives them the search results. Well, it's kind of the same if you build an application on, uh, on Ethereum at the moment, your users have to care about owning Ether. If you build it on Polkadot, your users are divorced from the concept of dot tokens. It's only you who have to care about it as the application developer. Your users just use your application in the way that you want them to use it. Right. Kevin, thank you so much for chatting. It's a pleasure. We'd like to talk to you more. We have to wrap up for the, for the day, but uh, thanks for coming out. Likewise. Cheers for, cheers for the chat. Just go and they come back in.